Testament contains four gospel accounts of the life, purpose, and meaning of the most unique man in history. Yeshua of Nazareth, better known in the Western Christian Church as Jesus Christ. Now, the creation and ordering of this New Testament addition to the Bible occurred early in the third century AD. And until that time, it consisted only of what Gentiles call the Old Testament. What I just told you about when the New Testament was created is not in particular dispute among Bible scholars. Right? However, it does tend to startle and worry many lay Christians and pastors when they learn this. So I can be clear in what this means for modern believers. I want to expand upon what I just stated. Now, while it's true that the four Gospels and some of Paul's letters and many more documents were, were circulated among the dozens of congregations of believing Jews and Gentiles in the first century, that is, only a, a few decades, the first few decades following Christ's birth, death, and resurrection, the only authorized document that was the Bible for these believers continued to be the Hebrew Tanakh, the Old Testament. The four Gospels and the several letters from Paul were considered important, as were other documents, by the way, that have been lost to history and some preserved but not accepted by the modern church as inspired. And they carried the same kind of authority as any edict of religious leadership bore in that era. However, and this is so important to understand, at that time, these Gospels, these letters were not considered to be New Holy Scripture, nor were they seen or intended as the contents of a new and different Christian Bible. In fact, the person that suggested such a radical idea was a Gentile named Marcion. The first recorded attempt to actually consider Paul's letters and certain of the Gospels as Holy Scripture actually happened in 144 AD. Marcion, who was a European, was a recent Christian convert. He was a wealthy, a powerful shipping magnate. He was not a church leader. But he did write a book, and it struck a chord among the now thoroughly Gentile-dominated church. In his book that was entitled Antithesis, he put forth his personal theology, and it began with the proposition that all things of Jewish origin and flavor must be eliminated from the church. The church father Ignatius agreed with this viewpoint. Therefore, according to Marcion and Ignatius, the church needed to create a new Gentiles only Christian Bible. And then, once created, to declare the Hebrew Bible that had been their only Bible as null and void for Gentile followers of Jesus. Marcion also declared that the Christian Bible should consist only of the Gospel of Luke, plus certain of Paul's epistles. But even then, it should not include the entire Gospel of Luke. What amounts to the first four chapters were to be eliminated since they dealt with the Jewish lineage of Christ. Marcion was widely denounced, but he also gained a substantial following. No known church body formally adopted his proposition, at least not in the form he suggested, and not until many years had passed. Even when the Gospels, Paul's letters, 
and the book of Revelation were finally adopted by the church, canonized, and declared inspired of God early in the first, in the third century to form the first New Testament. The Old Testament was retained as the foundation of the Christian Bible. So, as an important context, as a background for us to correctly discern the meaning of the Gospels and of all of the New Testament, we must accept that while today we rightly look upon the New Testament as inspired of God and as infallible in its original, as is the Old Testament, in no way was that how the writers of these New Testament books saw their own literary works? Nor did the early readers of these documents assign to them the divine and inspired status of the venerated Old Testament. Which of the several Gospels and other documents would be included in the New Testament vacillated over the years, depending on the branch of the church and which bishop was in charge at the time. The books and the order they are presented in that we see today in the West is either the Protestant version or it's the Catholic version. The Catholic version contains several apocryphal books that are not included in the Protestant version. Even more, the books of James, Hebrews, and Revelation have been removed, added back in, removed again, and so on over the centuries, depending on the church branch. However, for the sake of simplicity, we can generally say that in our time, the order of the New Testament books is the same for nearly all Christian denominations and branches. Therefore, Virtually all New Testaments open with the four Gospels. And in the order of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, interestingly, the first three Gospels are seen as having a different approach to telling about the life of Christ when compared to the fourth Gospel, the Gospel of John such that the first three are lumped together and are called the synoptic gospels. The word synoptic is taken from the Greek and it means to see together. So the idea is that the first three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are similar to one another and they more or less all seek to tell a simple story in an easy to read style. Yet, despite the similarities, there are differences and there are a number of complexities when you compare them. The Gospel of John is seen by Bible scholars as substantially different enough in approach and style so as to not be included among the synoptics. This is in no way an attempt to diminish the importance of or the impact of the fourth gospel. Even so, I question this scholarly attempt to make John's gospel as a sort of outlier as compared to the first three. When one researches various Bible academics explanations for why it's proper for the Gospel of John to be seen as different enough from the others so as to be considered as a whole separate category, one begins to understand just how subjective and arcane the arguments are. For instance, and we've all heard this, John's is usually said to be what? The spiritual Gospel. I have no idea what that means. I mean, are the first three absent of any spiritual element? Really? 
I mean, in defense of that dubious label, Bible scholars point out that while the Synoptic Gospels all begin with an important event in the human life of Yeshua, John starts with Yeshua's eternal and divine nature by saying, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Yet John quickly veers into many acts of Yeshua during his life on earth. Bottom line, I think the grouping of the first three Gospels together and separating out John's as something substantially different is overblown. And it's little more than an academic attempt to rethink, if not revise, these Gospel accounts. In fact, this grouping of the three into something similar and common and therefore different and apart from the fourth only occurred shortly before the beginning of the 19th century and only in the West. From my viewpoint, each of the four Gospels brings its own distinctive perspective to the life, purpose, and meaning of Messiah Yeshua. And since they're all telling the story of the same man, there is natural overlap and repetition. At the same time, since not everything Jesus did can possibly be included in these modest-sized documents, each author has picked and chosen what he thought to be the most significant events that his readers ought to know about. And to a degree, he presented events that helped put together a logical progression in history of Jesus' life in order to best explain who he was and the impact he made. Now, over the next many months, we will be examining only the Gospels, and of them, only the first, the book of Matthew. Before we begin in earnest, we need to get some important housekeeping matters out of the way by dealing with some issues that are going to come up. And the first is, why is Matthew the first Gospel? Now, naturally, Bible scholars are divided on this issue. The oldest extant New Testament manuscripts we have have Matthew as the first gospel. Although we have large fragments of these four gospels going all the way back, amazingly, to the second and third centuries. In other words, before there was a declared New Testament. The oldest complete New Testament is from the 4th century, and it's given the name Codex Sinaiticus. So the only evidence available is not only th that it's not only the first book of the New Testament, but it is the first of the four gospel accounts. Why was it put first? In that order. The most logical explanation is that it was the first gospel written. Yet the majority of modern scholars don't accept that Matthew is the oldest. They say it was Mark. Now the gospel accounts all contain similar events, similar stories about events in Yeshua's life and many of the same sayings that he said. Sometimes the accounts and the sayings are identical. At other times, they vary. How is this explained? Let's begin by grasping that none of the three so called synoptic gospel writers were eyewitnesses to Christ's life, but the author of the fourth gospel. John claims he was an eyewitness. Listen to John chapter 21, verses 20 to 25. 
Kepha, Peter, turned and saw the Talmud, the disciple, Yeshua especially loved, following behind. The one who had leaned against him at the supper and had asked, Who is the one who is betraying you? And on seeing him, Kepha said unto Yeshua, Lord, what about him? And Yeshua said to him, If I want him to stay on until I come, what's it to you? You follow me. Therefore the word spread among the brothers that that Talmud, that disciple, would not die. However, Yeshua didn't say he wouldn't die. He simply said, if I want him to stay on until I come, what's it to you? This one is the Talmud, is the disciple who was testifying about these things and who has recorded them, and we know that his testimony is true. But there are also many other things Yeshua did. And if they were all to be recorded, I don't think the whole world could contain the books that would have to be written. It is claimed in our time that the actual authors of the three synoptic gospels are anonymous. And that only after the gospels were anonymously written were they finally, somewhat arbitrarily, eventually, assign names. Margaret Davies, in her book Studying the Synoptic Gospels, uses the typical rationale for saying that the Gospels only received their names at a late date. She says, the Gospel writers, it'll turn out, did not follow the usual Greek and Roman practice of naming themselves, but rather the tradition of anonymous publication a practice frequently followed in Jewish literature. Like with a couple of other issues we're going to explore, this one is interesting in light of how the modern Bible scholars have come to this conclusion. I want to begin with evidence that's outside of the Bible itself. Irenaeus. Bishop of Lyon wrote his great work against heresies, not later than 180 AD. Again, remember, we're talking about before the New Testament was created. In that work, he not only quoted specific gospel passages that match what we have in our New Testaments today, he also named each gospel by the names we use today. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now if we go back another 40 years to about 140 AD, Papias, the bishop of Hierapolis, also alludes to at least some of the gospels as he mentions Matthew and Mark by name and says he got some of this information about Matthew and Mark documents from an unnamed but earlier church elder. No matter. The fact that these two Gospels are named by around 110 AD or so says that Matthew and Mark were called by those names no later than the de generation following their creation. However, even with this evidence, sitting before our modern Bible scholars, again, Margaret Davies assumes the same conclusion they do. She says, in the period of 190 to 150 AD, though our Gospels probably had been written, the author's names were not known. In this period, Papias stands alone. Oh, what a strange statement. Papias stands alone. In other words, during this time period of 90 to 150 AD, since the only written record of the Gospels already being named as Papias, then this evidence has to be thrown out. To my thinking, if Papias was a liar, and for what possible purpose, 
He was also clairvoyant because he predicted what the gospel names would be in the future. And yet, do these Bible scholars have some kind of firm evidence that the gospels were not named by this time? To contradict Papias, they use what writers of that same era do not say when quoting gospel passages that are similar to what we find in the gospel accounts today. That is, some of the writers in the 90 to 150 AD time frame do not mention the gospels by name, but they quote some passages. And then many modern Bible scholars say, see, this is positive proof the Gospels could not have possibly been named. And so they were anonymous, even though Papias of that same era did list the Gospels by name. But because he was just one person and his testimony doesn't arrive at the same conclusion these authors seek, these scholars seek, then it's discarded. No record exists of any early church father, fathers challenging the notion that the authors of the Gospels were known and attributed to each Gospel from the time of their creation. So as preposterous as it seems that some modern scholars just refuse to take the historical record to settle this matter, this is not the only issue concerning details about the creation of the Gospels, where modern Bible scholars use the same strategy of simple denial of the written historical evidence. Since we find the same or very similar quotes from Christ used among the Synoptic Gospel accounts, then the question of this is this, which Gospel account was written first, such that other ones borrowed from it? Right or wrong, it is generally the belief of modern scholars that Mark is the earliest gospel written, with Matthew especially drawing heavily from it. This would be a very good time to explain something important about these synoptic gospel accounts, since very likely none of the authors were eyewitnesses to Christ's life. Where did they get their information? Clearly, this is a valid question to ask. Some say that if Mark was the first gospel that was written, when we find the same or similar quotes then used in Matthew and Luke, then it means Matthew and Luke must have used Mark's gospel as one of their chief sources of information. But then this also begs the question, okay, if that's true, what was Mark's sources, if indeed his was first? The answer is that it is not known, but it can be reasonably deduced that documents containing quotes from Christ and other details of his life events had to be in existence prior to the Gospel accounts being written. How many? of these other sources existed, what they were, who wrote them down, we just don't know. Now, I'm not going to bore you with the tiny details of just how modern Bible scholars have come to the conclusion that it was Mark who wrote his gospel first, and Matthew then especially drew his, drew his information from his. However, the method is that generally similar quotes from Mark, Mark Mark and Matthew are held up side by side, and then modern experts choose which one they think is authentic. It's pretty much that simple. Often this choice is made on the assumption that the shorter quotation is the correct one and the longer one is merely modifying the shorter. What evidence is there for this? None. It's just all subjective analysis. 
So while the academic world tilts heavily towards Mark being the first gospel written and with Matthew and Luke drawing from it, there is a substantial minority who insists that it was the Matthew gospel that came first and Mark and Luke drew from him. Now it's unlikely this debate will ever be fully settled since there is no absolute proof either way. But a related issue is this. While all of the existing copies of the gospel that we have today were written in Greek, there are hints and implications within the Matthew gospel itself that suggest that it could have been originally written in Hebrew or Aramaic and then very soon translated into Greek. And connected to that matter is this. Was Matthew a Gentile or a Jewish believer? Now the Gentile church from as early as the mid second century wanted little connection between the Jewish people and Christianity and therefore desired to have a separate Christian Bible that emphasized Gentile authority and Gentile preeminence. So in modern times, a broad-based wish that is expressed in the strong opinions by Bible scholars and church authorities of the gospel authorship does not take kindly to the idea that any of the gospel accounts were written by Jews. If indeed the Gospel of Matthew was originally written in Hebrew or even Aramaic, then it's very nearly indisputable evidence that Matthew was a Jew. And so the Gospel was written for his Jewish readers. Therefore, every effort is made to prove that Matthew was a Gentile. So, is there any firm evidence at all that might settle this matter? There is some evidence within the gospel itself, but external sources are much more powerful. Eusebius, Bishop of Caesarea, this is around 300 AD, makes a statement that he attributes to having originally come from Papias 150 years earlier. He says this, now Matthew made an ordered arrangement of the oracles in the Hebrew language, and then each one was translated as he was able. Irenaeus, Bishop of Lyon, around 180 AD, also referred to Papias in regard to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew, also among the Hebrews, published a written gospel in their own dialect. But here's where it gets interesting. When Peter and Paul were still preaching in Rome and found the church there. These ancient records state unequivocally that the gospel of Matthew was written while Peter and Paul were still alive. That's the early to mid-60s AD. And that Matthew was a Hebrew, and that he published the gospel in his own dialect, which truly could have been either Hebrew or Aramaic because they're very close cousin languages and both were spoken fluently among ordinary Jewish folk in the first century AD. And so, from the reference to Peter and Paul, an actual written historical record, we can rather easily deduce that Matthew was almost certainly the first gospel account written, and thus Mark and Luke had to have drawn at least some of their information and their quotes from him. And if this is fact, it would seem to offer insight as to the reason 
that the Christian council decided that the order of the Gospels to open the New Testament as they did was because to their knowledge, Matthew should be first because he was written first. Mark is second because it was written second. Luke is third because it was written third. And John is fourth because it was the latest gospel written. Now, surprisingly, many notable Bible scholars since the early 19th century say that Eusebius, Irenaeus, and Papias, ah, oh, they're all wrong. They're all wrong. These earliest church fathers are thought to be in error, even though they were just a few generations from the time when the Gospels were written, and Papias may have been living when the Apostle John was still alive, as he implies that he personally heard John speak. Now, I hope you're seeing the pattern here. Any ancient attestation against what some modern Bible scholars wish to prove is just brushed aside. Too much in our time, especially linguistic experts, are certain that they know the ancient languages and their meanings better than those who lived and spoke them 2,000 years ago and more. Despite what eyewitnesses said occurred and recorded it in their ancient documents, including such details as exactly who was involved, when and what order these events happened, what it meant to those who lived it, modern historians often believe that they're better equipped hundreds, even thousands of years later, to give us a more accurate account in meaning. Not to be too harsh. The word I would use to describe such chutzpah is revisionist history. So while many of these highly regarded, regarded modern era Bible scholars have indeed aided me in my studies, and that of many hundreds of others, I cannot sidestep that such conclusions are just based on their own opinions and on their doctrinal beliefs that at times just simply go directly against the written ancient evidence we have. The point's this. Personal study and research make it my viewpoint that Matthew was a Jew and his gospel is aimed primarily towards Jewish believers. Daniel Harrington, in his commentary on Matthew, entitled Sacra Pagina, says this in the introduction. This commentary on Matthew's Gospel has been written from a Jewish perspective, one that I believe is simply demanded by the text itself. Obviously, I, I completely agree with Harrington, and as his commentary and other fine commentaries expose, the Gospel of Matthew is just filled with Semitisms, that is, filled with Jewish cultural expressions that can be masked by their translation into Greek and then into other languages, most notably English. But even more important, these Jewish expressions can be misunderstood, especially when they're taken out of their first century Jewish context. Okay, further, while the other Gospels also contain some amount of Semitisms, Matthew, without doubt, pays the closest attention to the Torah, both oral and written. This can be best expressed by the curious reality that Christ's seminal speech during his few years of ministry, a speech Christians rightly venerate and call it the Sermon on the Mount, is found only in the Gospel of Matthew. Only in the Gospel of Matthew. 
So important was it to Matthew that he devoted three full chapters to it. I want to take just a moment to state that while it is possible that Luke was a Gentile, Mark certainly wasn't, and of course neither was John, so I'm not making the contention, contention that of the Gospels only Matthew had a Jewish author. Rather, I'm saying that of the three synoptic Gospels, Matthew can rightly be said to be the most Jewish in its form, in its approach, in the way it addresses matters that were critically important to the Jewish community. In fact, Matthew used much Jewish rhetoric. He used several themes that only Jews would have inherently understood. So as 21st century readers of the Bible, expanded explanations on certain subject matter that we hope would have been there isn't. Why? Because for Matthew's intended Jewish audience, no expanded explanation was necessary. We're going to talk about this considerably more as we begin to explore the text of the Matthew Gospel chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Now, although I've already explained that some early church fathers that lived only a generation or two after the time that the Gospel writers lived, they stated and recorded that Matthew was the first Gospel written, the question of exactly the year it was written needs to be answered. Now, there's two trains of thought in Bible academia about this. The first train of thought is that it was written before the destruction of the temple that happened in 70 AD. The second is that it was written after. The first takes into account the ancient records that says Matthew was written first in Hebrew or Aramaic and while Peter and Paul were still alive. And since we know that Paul died somewhere in the mid-60s AD, then the record of the early church fathers makes it clear that Matthew had to have been written prior to the temple destruction of 70 AD, which came about five years after Paul's death. The second train of thought is that Matthew was written after the temple destruction. This is because such a time frame fits a whole lot better with the modern era Bible academic belief that Mark, not Matthew, was the first gospel written. Their lone piece, this is amazing to me, their lone piece of biblical evidence for this firm conclusion that, Ma that Mark came first comes from a statement in Matthew, chapter 24, verses 1 and 2, and by the way, it's also used in Luke's gospel. Here it is. As Yeshua left the temple and was going away, his Talmudim, his disciples, came and called his attention to its buildings. But he answered them, You see all these? Yes, I tell you, they're going to be totally destroyed. Not a single stone will be left standing. Therefore, since Matthew and Luke included this prediction from Christ in their Gospels, and Mark didn't, then for most 20th and 21st century Bible scholars, this is proof enough that this statement was inserted only because the writer of Matthew wanted to prove that Yeshua's prophecy actually came true. In other words, it's just a phony statement. It's looking backwards. Not, it's not prophetic. He's looking back. What we find all too often in modern commentaries on Matthew, and of all the Gospels for that matter, is this sort of pseudo-forensic study of the minds of the authors of the Gospels, in which the commentary writer claims to know 
what the gospel writer was thinking at the time and what his motives were behind the sayings that he did, or in some cases for omitting pieces of information. I don't mean to be rude. But geez, I, I find such an attempt at dissecting the minds of people of another culture who lived 2,000 years ago as a bridge too far. What these scholars decide cannot, of course, ever be disproved. Of course, nor can it be proved. But they can persuade. And that makes their practice dangerous. Today's new standard is that if a preponderance of Bible scholars share the same opinion, it amounts to fact. But the fact is, none of the synoptic gospel accounts make direct mention of the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. That much is certain. Admittedly, no mention of it is not proof positive that the destruction had not already occurred by the time of the Gospel's creation. After all, and this is important, the Gospel accounts were meant to be about the life of Jesus, who died about 40 years before the temple was destroyed by the Romans. So speaking of the destruction of the temple would have been outside the context of the purpose and scope of their work. Why would they want to talk about that? So the only direct statements we have as direct evidence from which to judge when Matthew may have been written are from people who are the likeliest to know and who had no discernible motives to lie or make up a story like this from thin air. The earliest church fathers, Eusebius, Irenaeus, Papias, all say that the Gospel of Matthew was written during a time that Peter and Paul were still preaching in Rome, which was in the mid 60s AD. The church father Origen of Alexandria, Egypt, also agreed with Papias. Origen lived during the time that the New Testament was first organized and canonized early in the 200s AD. So I can only conclude that Matthew's Gospel was written in the mid-60s AD concurrently with the ministries of Peter and Paul in Rome. Now, while we can trust, absolutely trust, all of the Gospel accounts, I think Matthew's is especially important because of its early date and because he was obviously, at least to my thinking, an educated Jew who was very familiar with the Torah and with Jewish religious tradition and social structure. But was he a Holy Land Jew or was he a diaspora Jew that lived in a distant land? It matters because it deals with what kind of culture he was steeped in. A Hellenized Greek-speaking culture or a more traditional Hebrew and Aramaic-speaking Jewish culture. Interestingly, of those scholars who accept Matthew's Jewishness, the bulk label him as a Palestinian Jew. For them, the term Palestine is a substitute for the Holy Land or for Judea and Galilee. This means that he was geographically residing near to the temple such that he could be involved with his many activities, but he was also near the center of synagogue authority such that he was well versed not only in the Law of Moses but also in the traditions of the Pharisees who were the dominant religious sect within the synagogue system. Now, while we're, we'll discuss at length the religious and social systems 
of both the Holy Land Jews and the Diaspora Jews in following lessons, I do want to close out our time together with this. During at least the last 150 years leading up to Christ's birth, and all during His lifetime, and all during the lifetimes of Peter and Paul and of all the original disciples until the fall of the temple to the Romans in 70 AD, the Jewish people operated under a dual, generally complementary religious system. However, this dual system was run by two different sets of authorities and they couldn't have been more different. The one system was the temple system. It was under the authority of the Sadducees. They were aristocrats who inherited or purchased their positions of authority. The other system, well that was the synagogue system, under the authority of educated rabbis and scribes, the common class who nearly universally, uh, universally were members of the sect of the Pharisees. These two systems were not necessarily rivals, but they each occupied a certain space in the overall Jewish religious scheme that was, generally speaking, inseparable from everyday social life. But a natural tension, of course, existed between the two. The temple was where biblically mandated feasts and sacrifices occurred, and it's where the judicial system operated. The synagogue system was a result of the Babylonian exile, when the temple and its system went defunct for a time. Organized religion, religion was a critically important part of every person's life in that era, pagan or Jew. So for the Jews up in Babylon, they just couldn't tolerate not having some sort of religious system operated by some kind of authority that was Hebrew in its nature. Priests, well, they were only authorized to rule in the temple. So this new system was run by what the church would call laypersons. Especially after their release from captivity in Babylon, about 95% of all Jews chose not to go home to the Holy Land, but rather to live in foreign nations. 95%. Even though Ezra and Nehemiah had led the rebuilding of the temple, the reinstatement of its priestly system, the bulk of Jews remained far away from the temple and its influence. So for them, the synagogue authority and synagogue system emerged and it became the center of their Jewish religious expression. Only later, perhaps 70, maybe 80 years, before Yeshua was born, did the synagogue actually finally take hold in the Holy Land. And by the way, nobody believed that until the last few years, and they found a synagogue in the Holy Land that, that, was, uh, that, they, that they give a date of 70 BC. So it's been proved. But when that system did take hold in the Holy Land, it became very popular and every bit as important to the Jewish people as the temple system, but just in different ways. Clearly, of all the Gospel writers, Matthew was the one who was most familiar with the full scope of Jewish religion. The religion and the culture of our Savior, Yeshua the Christ, and it is why 
It is his, his gospel is the one we're going to study. Thank you.